But hello there. Yeah, it's been a long time. But we're going to get into it. And hopefully, we're going to get into a lot. But first... Oh, no. Uh-uh. Did they take my bubbles away? Nope. There you go. Bubbles. We are starting with chapter 13. Don't know where I'm going to stop, but I'm going to try and read as much as I can. This chapter is titled, Coping with Adult Life. Anything and everything was exposed and deemed acceptable in California. A homosexual lifestyle didn't have to be kept secret there as it did back in Michigan. Men were attracted to me and openly spoke their minds about it, which offended me because of my past with Bobby. I felt as if something queer had been permanently affixed to me because of the horrible things he had done to me. I blamed him for the unwanted attention I was getting from men. Ooh, I gotta stop right there. Um, quite a few gay men told me. And that's where that whole term gaydar comes from. Now, Thomas may not have identified with being a gay man, but that gaydar will let a homosexual man know that he's been tampered with, if he will. I had never confronted Bobby about what he'd done to me. Instead, I've gotten high or occupied myself with women in order not to have to deal with it. I had to be honest with myself. The whole man with a man thing had me on edge. I did learn through my industry peers, however, that it was necessary to be appealing to both genders in order to sell lots of records. Still, it bothered me a great deal. At this point, Bobby was dating women. The way he spoke to and about females led me to believe that he was really into natural affections. There was a brief period of time when I actually thought Bobby might be straight. However, as he became more sure of himself as an artist and comfortable in his surroundings, the more he openly expressed his like for men. Something perverse had burned a hole in his soul he was unable to handle feelings that went along with being in a close and natural union with a woman. I watched as homosexuality manifested itself in Bobby's life. Anyone could see, or at least I could clearly see, that he had a stronger attraction towards men than women. He had a male friend, Tony, whom he had met in California and whom accom- who accompanied him everywhere after a while. Bobby kept his composure around him. They didn't carry on as a couple out in public. They hung out as friends. I found Tony to be a nice young man who held interesting conversation. I didn't question it at first. I just accepted Tony because Bobby did. After a while, though, Bobby removed all restraints from his sexual desires. He didn't care if his private life was private or exposed. He was staying at the Howard Weekly Hotel in Hollywood, where he paid for his room by the week, and Tony stayed there with him. I tried to ignore the obvious inordinacy of affection between them by laughing things off and often looking the other way. I didn't want to believe that my brother was involved with a man. I would invite Bobby to parties and places where I knew women would be prevalent in order to break him away for a breath of something different. He refused because he was into Tony. I was with Bobby in his hotel room one evening when he pinned Tony against the wall and kissed him like he was kissing a woman. His tongue was in Tony's mouth and he embraced him. They kissed and caressed each other without shame. My mind was scrambled to find a cover-up for the situation, but there was none. I had no choices but to face the facts. Though it was the most appalling perception of Bobby's lifestyle I'd experienced up to that point, 
it was definitely outdone in years to come by other situations. I confronted Bobby later that evening when he and I were alone. I asked him several questions because I wanted to understand what his thoughts were. Perhaps I misunderstood what I'd seen. Maybe he was playing a cool trick on me that we would laugh about together. After all, my big brother was always kidding around. I hoped he had a reasonable explanation. Isn't that part kind of confusing to you? It's like, uh, Tommy, why are you confused about your brother Bobby when he used to, you know, rape you? And, okay. He sat and talked with me in depth, revealing that he understood himself to be bisexual, meaning that he participated in sex with both men and women. His words cut deep during our conversation. He explained to me that he liked it all, but that if he had to make a choice, he would prefer a male. Bobby confused love and sex in his reasoning. He stated that he'd never had a man's love, that a man's love was what he was searching for, and that women, though useful for sexual pleasure, couldn't really be trusted otherwise. He used neglect and abuse from the past as an excuse for his sexual perversion. I knew there was no excuse. He could come up with all kinds of conclusions, but the bottom line was that it was his own choice. I told him it wasn't possible to love a man in the same manner as a woman. I explained to him that it was uh, disgraceful to God because he hadn't created man that way. He stuck to his misunderstanding. I decided that since we were on the topic, it was a good time to ask him about what he had done to me as a child. He said he regretted what he had done to me back then, explaining that he was just a boy. I waited to hear, I'm sorry, but he didn't apologize for any of it. I confided in him how I feared homosexuality based on what he'd done and how there was a battle underway within me to pull me into the direction of perversion. I explained to him how my thoughts really got twisted when I got high and that specific demonic pull seemed to intensify. He was quiet for a moment as my confusion caused the wound of guilt and blame he bore to foster even more. Bobby was never without words. I realized then that what he had done to me haunted him as much as it did me. Thoughts were clearly amiss in my big brother's mind. He acted desperately as a child in search of some sense of pleasure, and now I looked at where he was as an adult. His heart had become callous. He had departed from love long ago, so for him to say he was in love with a man didn't mean much to me because I knew that he didn't understand what love truly was. Because Daddy had never defined who we were as men, Bobby believed things about himself that just weren't true. He didn't attempt to falsely accuse God of creating him as a homosexual. He just admitted that he liked that lifestyle and that was a type of behavior he was going to participate in if he felt like it. I reasoned, it's just the drugs, you're just under the influence. But he insisted his preference was by his own will, not drug related, nor was it an immature habit bound to pass away. He told me he'd felt that way long before he used drugs, reminding me of various situations of our youth that in hindsight made sense. To sum it up, Bobby told me Tommy was his lover and that was that. Despite his choice, Bobby didn't carry himself in an effeminate manner. As his involvement with men continued, and as more of his own human spirit was consumed, manifestation of female characteristics became more apparent to me. On stage, though, he was a ladies' man. It was the same way he'd acted as a youth, with his secret desires only fully exposed behind closed doors. Katrina, this book is deep. I discerned 
That approval was what Bobby truly needed from me. I took a deep breath and swallowed my hurt feelings over the lifestyle he'd chosen. I then made my own decision in the situation. I decided I was going to treat him the same way no matter what, which was the same type of unconditional love I wanted from him. My drug use increased as a way of coping with this newly added internal pressure. I loved my big brother, and watching his life decline further and further away from normality ate away at what same thoughts I had remaining. I chose not to face his situation with a sober mind. Drugs numbed me so I could accept whatever came my way. In my acceptance of him, I went along to clubs for gays when he invited me <clears throat> until he became somewhat of a regular and got to know people. I danced with him. We did the hustle, the bump, the freak, and the rock as the popular upbeat dances <laughs> during that time. Wow. I still can do all those dances. But who would hustle and bump and do the freak with their own brother? Or two brothers, huh, child? I stuck by him as he did what he enjoyed. Had I not accepted him as he was, his pride wouldn't have allowed him to care. He would have continued being Bobby, regardless of what I thought. I didn't want to be barred from his life, so I chose to let him know that I loved him by staying by his side. Daddy was still living in Detroit and decided to visit California to see how we were faring out on our own. Ducky and I were serious about each other and were living together in an apartment on Langdon Street in Los Angeles when he arrived. Bobby had his own apartment in the Wilshire District. Daddy planned to stay with Bobby during his visit, assuming he was living alone. Oh boy, this is going to get interesting. It was a bland reunion for both of us boys. I felt somewhat empty inside seeing him. He didn't stir up animosity or sadness. He was just there. Unconsciously, my, res my resentment had built a strong fortification that barred Daddy from entrance. I was indifferent towards him, perhaps still numb. He had abandoned me with no wisdom to manage my adult life and then showed up to ask how I was doing. I hadn't even expected him to come to California to see either of us. The visit went well because Daddy kept our conversation superficial. He didn't say anything about the past, and I didn't either. It was when he tried to fit in as a father after so many years of absence that he met a strong oppositional attitude from Bobby. On day two of the visit, Bobby was already fed up. He called me to pick Daddy up. He said he was cramping his style. He didn't want him around asking questions about his lifestyle or trying to give him guidance. Daddy finished out his visit with me and then returned to Detroit. Oh, that was a dud. I thought Daddy was going to find out that Bobby was a homo and try to beat the gay out of him. Not. Eight to 16 hours per day were spent on spent in the studio or rehearsal hall perfecting the sound of switch. Other Motown acts worked long hours as well to preserve the legacy of soul music. Bands had various managers, but ultimately, Barry Gordy was the hard director enforcing the work ethics in the industry. I was It was enjoyable initially as I came into the entertainment life with zeal for rehearsing. But the hectic schedule took a toll on me as negative aspects in my life compounded. The stress of not dealing with important emotional matters made my reactions to record company demands, to record company demands sluggish. I was lazy when it came to going to the studio all the time. My thoughts groaned at obedience to the rules governing the group. I wanted to sleep in and then show up for scheduled sessions in my own timing. Often, I didn't even get out of bed. The same rebellious attitude from childhood crept up on me and interfered with my commitment to my music contract. As I ran from the pain behind me, 
the goal before me became obscured. Ducky was now pregnant with our first child. Two previous pregnancies had ended in abortion. We decided together to keep this one. I moved us into an apartment on Lenox Street in on Lenox Street in Van Nuys so we'd have more room for the baby. Neither of us was emotionally prepared to be parents, but I had grown tired of the guilty thoughts associated with us murdering two previous babies. Weighing the money I earned against all the things I frivolously wanted, sorry. Weighing the money I earned against all the things I frivolously wasted money on, I felt I could afford to take care of our child. I wasn't sure that I could manage the new adult responsibilities we were bringing upon ourselves, but I was willing to give it a try. I told Ducky I wanted to do things differently than my father had, and I made a covenant with him to never beat my child. I also promised myself to provide the proper material provision for all of his or her needs through the money I made for my career. However, my heart was shaky ground on which to build such promises because there was no real commitment there. Still, I promised upon what I had, a heart of good intentions. I acknowledged that our baby would have feelings and desires of which I would attend to. In spite of my abusive past, I will to do my best. The delivery room experience was laughable. I was nervous. Ducky's usual soft, appealing voice turned into a mad roar as labor pain struck. I tried to help out but seemed to only be in the way. A contraction came and the doctor firmly said to push in a loud voice. I physically lift, lifted her up from behind to assist with the contraction and the whole bed moved from one side of the room to the other as I pushed. <laughs> The doctors and nurses laughed as they explained that they were telling Ducky to push, not me. After what appeared to be an endless duration, she gave birth to my son, whom we gave my full name, Thomas Keith DeBarge II. We call him Little Tommy. Born at Cedar sinai Hospital, Little Tommy was my well-off baby. Ducky had no insurance, so I paid cash for his birth. I carried large sums of money on me at all times. And when we took him home, he slept next to us in his crib. I bought him nothing but Neiman Marcus items. I wanted him to have the best of everything. Little Tommy instantly became the central point of focus for me and Ducky. We had an opportunity to express love that we hadn't received from our parents. He was dear to my heart with a little face that looked like a combination of hers and mine. I expected little Tommy's birth to improve some of the personal issues between me and Ducky. We had been having a difficult time getting along. My thoughts weren't at peace when it came to her faithfulness to me, and my doubts were confirmed as I would catch her eyeing other men seductively. I confronted her on several occasions. She just blew my accusations off as part of my high. At other times, I said nothing. I just watched without her knowing. She was clever, so catching her in an actual lie was difficult. It was my gift of discernment that enabled me to see lust in her heart that wasn't directed towards me. I knew she wanted to be with other men, and her dishonesty about the matter drove me to anger. I tried harder to be what I thought she may have wanted in a man, I loved her and sim simply wanted her to completely love me too. As I had speculated in the beginning of our relationship, I wasn't sure I could fill her heart. Chapter 14, Cocaine, The New Woman in My Life. <clears throat> mm, cocaine is a hell of a drug, ain't it? Switch to... Our second album was released in 1979. The album was a success, bringing about gold singles and top 10 hits that were all written, written and produced by Bobby. During that release, Bobby and I were introduced to free bass cocaine while attending a party at a Jamaican man's home. Man, oh man, I should have stayed home that day. 
Cocaine was the culmination of all my previous attempts at escaping reality. Freebasing, Jesus. Drugs had become a serious problem for me at that point. This particular drug came complete with its own personal set of perversions, fantasies, delusions, anxieties, cravings, and split personalities fit for each user. As I inhaled the toxins of freebased cocaine, I took in the foul spirits that would entrap me at a new level of bondage. I was late or absent even more often from recording sessions and rehearsals. When studio time had to be rescheduled and the record company couldn't recoup their loss, I was confronted by Motown officials. I was told to get my actions together or my paycheck would suffer. I worked hard on being punctual, but my physical body wouldn't cooperate. On drugs, I couldn't live up to the responsibilities. The combination of my career, problem relationship, and drug use was becoming more than I can handle. Each waking moment of of every day was filled with drama while I was using drugs. Confusion had always been the normal frame of mind to me. However, it was fatally destructive when it came to my career. Because I'd grown up in disorder, I expected it and felt comfortable in it. I needed discipline to stay in the music game, but the stillness of mind required to achieve that discipline was like a foreigner from a distant land. My actions while on drugs were absurd. I went to visit my sister, Bunny, who was living in California with her husband. As I left her house, I forgot to put my Alfa Romero in the drive in drive from reverse. I stepped down hard on the gas and the car plunged through the wall of the apartment complex into a bedroom. A naked couple rushed out from their bed to make sure I was okay. I sat in my car, rendered senseless by the collision, covered with plaster. My eyes focused on two Caucasians standing over me with no clothes on. I wondered where I was and who they were. I wasn't harmed, just a bit loopy. I had to pay an extensive amount of money for damages to the building and my car. Things were falling apart. The fact that Bobby was supplying songs that topped the charts couldn't be disputed. Others in the group didn't want to admit it, nor did they have to. Bobby knew his songs and his voice were making switch the hit it was. He ranted that he was his own show and that whoever played behind him as a band and sang background vocals didn't really matter. He basically felt that he didn't need the group, but that Switch needed him. He believed the group was nothing without him. He made sure everyone knew that when he referred to them, he was excluding me, showing that I was on the same side as him. He had proven himself to be a songwriter, singer, and musician of value, and he was cocky as the star of the show. Fans loved to hear the music that came from the depths of his soul. It didn't matter to me who the star was as long as I got paid and had a chance to play. When Bobby was dissatisfied, everyone suffered. He felt the money he was receiving wasn't fair compensation for the work he was putting forth. Outwardly, He was a glamorous superstar. On the business end, he felt he needed to make some changes. He wanted a bigger paycheck. Bobby's initial desire to be a solo artist with his own choice of a band intensified through his disappointment with the salary he was receiving. He discussed alternatives with me often. I was behind Bobby 100% in whatever he did musically. I had always believed in him, and I believed that him always meant us. I couldn't do anything but stand back and watch as his childhood fear of people hurting him grew into a strong distrust distrust of everyone in the group. Bobby especially had a thing against Greg who was the one who came up with the plan that got us noticed by Motown in the first place. Bobby didn't hesitate in letting his negative feelings flow either, which caused friction within the group. Greg had known in the beginning that it would eventually come to this. 
Bobby went to Motown to ask for more money, causing much dissension among band members. He didn't care whose feelings got hurt by what he did. He boldly explained to the company that he was doing all of the hard work and that it was his creative genius bringing in the big bucks for Motown. He told them he was carrying the weight of Switch by writing the hits and that he was the driving force behind the Gold album. Because of this, he personally wanted more money. Bobby told me he attempted to negotiate more money for me too. He and I made the barge an image that he tried to use to my advantage. Motown, however, saw me as part of the band <laughs> that Bobby was complaining about. They refused to give me a raise and Bobby settled for an extra $2,000 per month for himself even though he felt he deserved more. Bobby always stood by his train of thought. The bad vibes couldn't be felt between him and certain members of the group. Bobby just didn't care about anyone but himself. He wanted what he felt was fair for him and he had made life miserable for whomever he could until he got his way. I began feeling like we were kids all over again. Bobby was becoming insolent once again in his comments towards me as a musician. He fronted me off for being late and not playing up to par. I knew my performance was lagging due to drugs and personal problems, but I expected sympathy from him for as much as he had the same issues. Instead, he judged me without compassion, talking, taking all of his frustrations out on me. I eventually ended up becoming one of them in Bobby's eyes. To him, I was no longer on his side. He told me when I looked bad, I had made him look bad. What he did and got away with as the lead singer, I could not, as his bass player and brother. It seemed to me as though I was taking a dose of anger for my own actions as well as his. My professional life and personal life had become too wild, and once again, the one person I wanted to turn to for assistance was part of the problem. As a result, my issues piled up like dirty laundry with no coins for the washer. I presented songs to be included on albums, but I was repeatedly rejected as a writer. Those in charge of song selection tore me down in my musical expressions. Bobby made sure to reinforce those negative statements against my songs, which hurt worse than a record label executive telling me no. I expected him to help me in areas where I needed assistance, whether it was lyrics or bridge. He had a great wealth of talent to share, but he, we, he withheld it from me. He just kept on trying to take control of the group in an unstable state of mind. It was difficult to remain optimistic in view of the cold heart of my big brother and a godless music industry. I couldn't cry on Ducky's shoulder about any of this. She and I were growing apart. I couldn't recall a period of time when we had been able to communicate without drugs in our systems. The relationship was like old soup warmed over in regards to affection. I tried even harder to be accepted by her because I felt so rejected, but I was only pushed away even more. I had become skeptical of her to the same degree that I had doubted Mama's love. She merely aggravated my firm belief that no woman would ever love me. My mind wandered back to, be, to the beginning of our, our relationship when I used to pick her up from school. Most of the time she would be there, but sometimes she wouldn't. I remember that on one occasion I arrived to discover from her friends that she had left two hours early. They told me they didn't know where she had gone. I knew they really did, but they just weren't telling me. I had then proceeded to Ducky's home after speaking to her schoolmates and parked out of sight. Momentarily, her ex-boyfriend pulled up with Ducky in the passenger seat. My heart sank. What I had suspected was true. She had still been seeing him. 
I had pondered what I would do for revenge. Quickly, I had gotten out of my car and gone over to his for a confrontation, but he saw me coming and drove off before I could speak with him. He left Ducky standing at the curb with disheveled hair and a look of surprise on her face. I questioned her, and she insulted my intelligence by lying to me. She told me she wasn't involved with him any longer, that they just got together as friends. She couldn't even look, me, look at me while she spoke. Her refusal to admit her true feelings for him caused a bit of insanity on my part. I just wanted her to tell me the truth. I knew she still cared for him. I felt it daily and I spent time, as I spent time with her. I had chosen to be faithful to Ducky because that was just the type of man I was. I didn't like having a bunch of women. However, when I had become aware of infidelity on her part, I had retaliated by using my own body to get back at her, which only hurt me even more. Getting a woman hadn't been a problem for me considering who I was, but it wasn't in my heart to cheat on the woman I loved, and it truly bothered me that I'd done that. I grew weary of trying to make someone be faithful to me who didn't want to be. I had to find a method of coping. The right thing to have done would have been to openly discuss her desires and then forgive her, but she didn't want to admit anything to me. I found it hard to forgive someone who wouldn't admit the truth. The other alternative was to forgive her without her admitting anything and just leave her alone. I knew I wasn't ready to do that. Never learning the proper steps of forgiveness hindered me in dealing with the situation. So I had stayed with her and had stayed angry about her sneaking around, which caused me to develop resentment towards her. I became obsessed with Ducky's involvement with others behind my back to the point that it was all I ever talked about. I was high off of cocaine regularly, which caused my mind to exaggerate the truth. I annoyed everyone around me with my accusations, but my heart ached over her. My entire pattern of thought was directed towards forcing her to confess to me and wanting her to love me. When she repeatedly chose to not be upfront with me, I resorted to more drug use. I felt like she was in my life to mold me into a madman. Between her and Bobby, I was going insane. Chapter 15 Following a Lost Leader Bobby began participating in the industry practice of hiring musicians for recording sessions instead of using switch band members. It was like drugs. Everyone was doing it. He was told that the reason behind him not being able to personally receive more money was because of the expense of, stu of studio time was too high. Studio musicians read charts and were able to come in and get the job done in less time than band members. I took the hiring of a bassist other than myself to record songs for Switch as an insult against my playing. Bobby, in his typical coldness, responded that it was just business. He wanted to look like more of a businessman behind the decisions he made, so he attempted to show as little partiality towards me as possible. Bobby was so focused on finding fault within the group that he didn't notice Motown's overwhelming desire for money. He agreed with them and looked for some extra funds to fall into his lap by tight, tightening, tightening this particular financial belt. We were all getting raped by the industry. As he made his move with the higher ups, his attention shifted away from his original beliefs that Motown's underhanded activities against artist royalties might be ripping him off to believing that the group was actually holding his money up. It was during this troubling time that Bobby took on the role of producer for Bunny, Randy, Marty, and Elle, who were in California anticipating their introduction on the music scene as the DeBarges. James joined them a few months later, 
relocating from Detroit where he had been staying with daddy while going to school. We were all living in various apartments on Langston, on Langdon Street in Los Angeles. Doing something positive in music with my brothers and sisters shed a light on what I considered to be a pretty dark era. I played bass on four songs, Dance All Night, Queen of My Heart, Share My World, and What's Your Name. An opportunity to be in the music business like me and Bobby was appealing to our younger siblings until their actual involvement. They experienced the coldness of Motown immediately with the rejection of their drummer, Freddie Gardner. Motown refused to allow Freddie to be part of the group on account of him not having the same trim body, fair skin, or sleek hair that was characteristic of the, of the DeBarge family. Freddie had been a close friend of the family and was a good drummer. Motown was switching their focus from the sound of good music to a sexy outer appearance in order to sell records. Freddie didn't have Motown's perceived image where those of the DeBarge clan were blessed with both talent and good looks. Mm. Freddie fell apart after being rejected by the company. He plunged deep into drugs, never returning to the mental state of the Freddie we once knew. He passed away a few years after his return to Grand Rapids. His death was drug related. The first album Bobby produced with the DeBarges didn't go very far. He believed in what he was doing and kept at it with them, drilling them to his perfect expectations. He had faith in the gifts of his family. He eventually lost momentum for the project and gave up his title of producer as he grew more dependent on drugs. Meanwhile, tension amongst the members of Switch reached a level of unbearable discomfort. Bobby's drug use brought heated contention to the forefront of what was supposed to be beautiful music. What he thought to be true in his mind was intermingled with lies creating distorted situations. My use of drugs was extreme too, but I was a background figure unable to cause noteworthy trouble in the business affairs. Bobby, on the other hand, was out front, usurping authority as a tyrant. He was like a roaring lion seeking to devour everyone around him. Motown approved a request for the group to spend some time in the Rocky Mountains in order to record away from the dissension found in the big city. The recording of Switch's third album, Reaching for Tomorrow, took place at Caribou Ranch in Boulder, Colorado. We were far removed from the distractions we thought hindered us from our direct concentration on music. Progress was made at a good pace within the elegant, peaceful surroundings. We felt at ease and creative. Everything we desired was made available to us at the ranch, including women and drugs. We stayed at the ranch for approximately one month. I thought that perhaps my life might finally be turning around. In that peaceful atmosphere, I was finally able to concentrate. I wrote a song titled, I Finally Found Somebody New, and that was allowed on the album. I was happy to be recognized as, the, as a writer and a more influential part of what was going on. Caribou Ranch was somewhat of an effort to try to end the band's quarreling. True enough, the absence of strife amongst us was in True enough, the absence of strife amongst us enabled a greater use of our talent and imagination, but it was only a momentary break from all of the bickering. I believe we were all in search of peace on the inside as well as the outside. Taking a brief look at my heart while being secluded like that allowed me to see what was around me wasn't the cause of my troubles. It was the bitterness in me that stirred controversy. I realized that breaking away from Hollywood wasn't the answer. Each of us had to get a grip on ourselves if we were going to function properly as a whole. Easier said than done. Things were turned upside down and I had no knowledge of how to flip them right side up. 
My life was sinful and I knew it. I realized I walked away from the only source of love available, God. I was living a fast life that had to come to a screeching halt at some point. As I slowed down for a moment at the ranch, I remembered my true desire to be loved and also knew that I was further away from this goal than I'd ever been. Chaos broke loose upon completion of the project and I returned to California. Too much money had been spent on the ranch. Bobby had a big disagreement with Jermaine over finances and suddenly our funds were tightened. Friend in the Sky and Don't Take Your Love Away were Bobby's hits from that album. Overall, he didn't see a, satisfa a satisfactory monetary gain. He was furious and spent weeks raving about Jermaine's poor management skills. He made everybody around him miserable with his complaining, especially me. It was a crazy time with all of the mishandling of money that was all anyone seemed to care about anymore. Since I'd spent my whole life in the midst of battling, I assumed it would just go away with everyone being unhappy. I didn't pause to acknowledge that Switch's kingdom was capable of tumbling down. With the release of our fourth album, This Is My Dream, came over first came our first major tour. A lengthy period of time away from Los Angeles again was welcomed after the anguish around, surrounding the recording. Motown had gone to extremes in response to our irrational composure as a band. The practice of hiring studio musicians and writers to get our job done continued, and the actual band's participation diminished immensely. I played bass on only a few songs and sang some background vocals. Bobby's hits off that album were Love Me Over and Over and You and I. He had many beautiful songs inside of him for the album that couldn't be birthed due to his emotional distress. He wasn't thinking clearly. The tour recompensed a portion of my stress by being financially profitable and fun. Perversion steadily climaxed toward its peak in my heart, though. I thought and did crazy things. The bands we toured with weren't any less debased. I walked into many hotel rooms where entire bands would be high and engaging in mockery of the human body through intercourse. Men with women, women with women, and groups of three, four or more together. It was unheard of. My fancy wasn't in the participation, but in viewing the sex acts of others. Drugs took me to a mental state of preoccupation with watching a man and a woman indulge in sex. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's really a thing, isn't it? Hmm. Upon our return to Los Angeles after the tour, Bobby was livid once again. He made indignant accusations against Motown and more specifically against Greg. He singled him out as a culprit of everything having gone bad. He had disagreed with Greg from the beginning, but much more now that he was paranoid. His constant grumbling about Greg going back behind his back to get money from promoters wearied me. My nerves couldn't withstand Bobby's fury. He just wouldn't let the topic go. He was like a madman. He boasted daily that he, not Greg, had made the name for Switch, and he said he was going to show them all who the group truly centered around. Along with the anger that had reached a high note was Bobby's decision to leave the group. He refused to work any longer with people he didn't trust. This Is My Dream was the last album Bobby worked on with Switch and Motown. He straightforwardly left the group, hanging by no longer showing up for rehearsals, and he instructed me to follow his lead. 
Greg attempted to replace Bobby and me. All the same, which, as the world knew it was over. The group didn't see success after our departure because our fans had grown accustomed to Bobby's strong falsetto and style of writing. In addition, my unique style of playing bass was expected to accompany his melodic tunes. It was the debarred sound that had attracted people to switch. Bobby went to work immediately on a solo project. His talent was an asset to any company, but his personal problems warranted caution. He recruited me to play bass on his tracks and to be a part of his band. I agreed, having nothing else on the burner. However, I knew in my heart that progress wouldn't be made on the recording. Motown wasn't going to be bothered with Bobby. There were too many other artists who weren't so hard to handle, even if they didn't have the, angel the angelic voice of Bobby DeBarge. I had considered Switch as a ram in the bush, but they also faced a bad situation when Motown chose not to renew their contract. I was out of a job either way. Nothing within me compelled me to pick up my bass and find another gig with a different band. I was pretty much burnt out after the whole Switch and Bobby experience. I was no longer just, it was no longer just me that I had to worry about though. I had Ducky and our son to take care of, and she was pregnant with our second child. Christian Robert Dior, whom she gave birth to shortly after the group breakup. Not knowing how I was going to take care of them scared me. I waited around for Bobby to pull things together in his career, but it didn't happen. Everybody blamed the drugs, but I knew his problems were so much deeper than that. He kept making plans and telling me to hold out until he got some things together with this company or that, but Bobby's promises never came to fruition. My nerves were severely on edge after Chris was born. The responsibility of it all seemed too much for me to bear. Chris cried a lot, which agitated me. When I tried to hold him, he would cry even louder. I couldn't seem to do anything to comfort him. I expected to be able to pick him up and speak kind words to him and everything would be okay. He didn't find that kind of safe feeling in my arms. Bobby criticized me about how I managed my family. It angered him that I wasn't being the man of my household. He said I walked around like a desperate wimp crying about a woman all the time. I felt he had a lot of nerve insulting me in front of Ducky when he was the reason behind my sudden poverty and had always been a cornerstone in my dysfunctional mind. I had no respect for his opinions and I let him know it. Ducky and I went through tremendous struggles when I left Switch. I descended from riches to rags in a very short period of time. I sensed that she didn't want to be with me any longer since I couldn't provide for her and the boys. Her cocaine addiction had gotten as bad as mine, and I wasn't able to keep up a steady supply of drugs for us anymore. I began selling things out of our apartment and relied upon a few favors that associates owed me in order to attain more drugs. I eventually lost my apartment, which forced Ducky to return to our mother's house with our two boys. I wasn't allowed to stay there with her because of the problems her mother felt I brought into her daughter's life. As a matter of fact, Helen told me not to come around her house at all. I went away. I would see familiar cars of dope dealers that Ducky and I both knew parked outside her house, which made me paranoid because I was aware of the coldness of dealers and her desperation to get high. I would practically beat the door down trying to enter, but she wouldn't let me in. I felt like a car rolling brakeless downhill full speed, out of control. Though I pretended to be bold through a lot of talk, I lived in total fear within. I stayed wherever I could lay my head, whether it was with my brothers, gay men who thought they might get some action with me, or women who thought the same. My brother, Randy, ended up separating from his wife, which made room for me in his apartment on Beck Street. My brothers and I were all going through a lot in our personal lives. Ducky came back to me when I moved in with Randy, 
because she and I hadn't worked through any of our problems. I felt she had only returned for the case of getting high. Regardless, I was glad to be reunited with her and my sons. All right. I have read chapters 13, 14, and 15. And you know what? I'm going to read chapter 16 because it's a short chapter. Chapter 16, Cut Back Down to Poverty. Hold on. Mute. Okay, I'm back with chapter 16. Cut back down to poverty. Motown began some bad practices with the group of DeBarge. They tore the group apart from the inside, creating contention within sibling relationships that were already unstable. Motown understood it to be standard business to pull a solo artist from a group, and they chose L. He appeared to the record company to have the complete package. Specifically, he wasn't getting high like the rest of his brothers and sisters. Yeah, go on. Barry Gordy's obsession with making money negatively affected my family. He treated them like dollar bills instead of brothers and sisters. The barge was more than the title of the group. It was a family structure. There was something I could do to help them because... Oh, there was nothing I could do to help them because I had no big brotherly advice to give to save the day. I never did. I felt like excess baggage at a time when my family needed to focus on their careers. Randy eventually got, con got evicted for not paying his rent. And again, I was with no income and in need of a place to stay. I refused to let Ducky and the boys live apart from me this time. Wherever I went, I had decided I was taking them with me. A relative of Daddy's named Tom had visited L previously, and fortunately, I had retained a phone number for him. I called him, and he invited me and Ducky, along with little Tommy and Chris, to stay with him in a trailer on his property. Tom was a veteran of the war and had quite an impressive gun collection. He told me I was family and we were welcome to stay as long as we needed to. Tom's neighbor, however, didn't like black people. He rose up to fight me one night after he'd been drinking heavily. I was ready to fight too because I was under so much pressure. Cousin Tom stepped in front of me though and he told me to go back into the trailer. I watched from the window as Tom beat that man violently with his fist until he dropped to the ground. Tom didn't know me well, but he had accepted me as daddy's son. As daddy's son. We had the same last name and shared common blood, and that was enough for him to stand in my defense against anyone. He lived by the principle that no one insulted his family. Wow, that's pretty cool. I like Tom. Ducky and I were uncomfortable in the middle, in the mobile home with our children, so we decided we needed to move on. Having to see that neighbor each day that Tom had beaten up was especially awkward. 
The way he would look at me let me know that another match brewed in his heart, but the next time would be specifically with me. We left Tom's after one month. Mama was in California staying with Elle at that time and became well aware of my problems. She had compassion on my sons and offered to take little Tommy and Chris back to Grand Rapids with her. The plan was for Ducky, who was pregnant yet again with our third child, to work some things out and then move to Michigan with the boys. Mama took my boys with her, and Marty let me and Ducky stay with him for a short time while we made some, deci some decisions. Billy Preston was a popular R&B recording artist at that time. He helped me out financially by taking me on tour with him to Australia. Melbourne was a beautiful city to visit with warm-hearted fans. The women were lovely. Even though I had a pregnant girlfriend and two children back at home, I met and became passionately involved with an extraordinarily beautiful model whose name was Samantha. I fell in love, or so I thought. I put away my mind. I put away from my mind the troublesome relationship I had with Ducky. Being involved with Samantha eased my worries. I soaked, her, I soaked up her kindness like a sponge since no one had been so nice to me in such a long time. She was affectionate like me and we enjoyed talking for hours at a time. She showed up my, at my hotel room one evening completely nude underneath a mink coat and high heeled shoes. The reality of the matter was that she existed as part of the tour, which meant she and I were only going to last for a short time. We agreed to stay in touch, but I didn't call her once I got back home. I was later told that she departed for Europe in pursuit of her modeling career. I never saw her again after that month that we spent together in Australia. Besides the money I made, meeting and getting to know her was the best part of the tour. Upon returning from the tour, not having a job in the, musical, in the music business drove me into a lengthy period of mourning. It was really like someone had died. I lost sight of my talent. In a right mind, a good bass player such as me would have picked up his bass and gotten another job. I didn't even try. I'd blown it, as usual. I blamed several factors while successfully avoiding my own lack of wisdom. There were still drugs around, so I stayed high in an attempt to adjust. My reactions to daily life were extreme, complete with anxiety, depression, tears, and mood swings. Drug abuse only prolonged dealing with the real problem, me. I was broke with no forthcoming royalty checks. At least Bobby still had money coming in based on Switch's record sales. But me, I hadn't been allowed to write for the album, so I had no credit as a writer except for that one song. I was told I had no money coming and I never looked into it. Renting apartments throughout my career had left me with no acquired real estate. Addiction, along with the lust of my flesh for material gain, had consumed any funds I should have put in a bank account. When my money ran out, it really ran out. It was at this low point in my life that Daddy made his second trip to California. Mommy had urged him to check on his sons. I was still staying with Marty in North Hollywood for the time being when Daddy arrived. He reprimanded me about not having a roof over my son's head. He also negatively commented on my girlfriend's pregnancy with our third child. He told me I wasn't being a man because I wasn't taking care of my family. He called me irresponsible and made me feel badly just as he had when I was a kid. He may have hoped to encourage me to straighten up with his cut downs, but encouragement just didn't work like that. He still wasn't fitting the mold of a father. I rudely remarked to Daddy that my life was none of his business. My commitment met, met head on with his pride, and he stood up to grab me. I readied my fists in defense, but immediately let down my guard with no intention of ever hitting my Daddy. In the heat of the 
ugly moment. He took hold of me and threw me across the table. I landed on the floor and just lay there for a moment. Instantly, I was a child again in my mind. I felt as if I was back in my boyhood in my boyhood body with him standing over me as a giant getting ready to pummel my f- small frame. The same paralyzing fear I felt during childhood flooded me. He was still the same physically aggressive man who walked out of my life when I was 15. Though I offered no battle, he came at me, ready to finish the job off as he had when I was a little boy. Bobby, Randy, and Marty were all there, and they pulled Daddy off me, hoping I wouldn't retaliate. All of his sons in the room that day were high, yet he chose me to swing on. It was as it had always been between him and me. He knew Bobby wasn't hearing his fatherly conversation and he'd never been, he'd never beaten Randy or Marty as kids the way he did me. I was the only son left to consider venting his frustrations on. I seemed to still be his gullible target. There I was, a grown man. And he was trying to re-enter my life the same way he exited, with brutality. I couldn't understand why he always resorted to violence with me. Daddy was really there to try to help in his own way. But I saw him as a meddling annoyance at that point. The things he said to me about manhood weren't true. But how could I tell him he was the reason I didn't have it all together? He ended up paying for a plane ticket for Ducky to go to Grand Rapids to live with Mama. The incident that occurred at Marty's apartment added an enormous amount of pain to my heart. The bitterness became a heavy weight that I felt would never be thrust from my shoulders as the scabbed sores from my past were reopened. When switch ended, it seemed my melodic desires ended. My life spiraled speedily downhill at thereafter. It was an important chapter in my life that I had to put behind me because I didn't have the power to resurrect the dead. People spoke of heaven and hell as future destinations, but I knew without a doubt that hell was a place of torment in every man's heart. My life became that living hell as every evil thought within me rose up to create a personality no one wanted to deal with. Within a month or so, I returned to Grand Rapids to join my family. How I hated going back to that dreaded place. Bobby also moved back there. I didn't know how Bobby perceived it, but to me, the return spelled out failure in giant dark letters across my forehead. We all lived at Mama's house, surviving day to day with addiction. All right. I have read chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. Chapter 17, I'm still flipping through the pages. It's a big chapter that I'm not going to have enough time to get into. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Yeah. I just appreciate the raw emotional honesty so far. Very good book. Thanks for tuning in. See you later.